All right, all right. Welcome to uh, another edition of uh, of that show in which seven former NBA players compete for valuable prizes and cash. <laughs> Actually, they sit around and talk for an hour about various topics. It's open court here on NBA TV. I'm Ernie Johnson, and let me introduce the panel. Uh, once again, uh, the big fella, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, is with us. A and a newcomer to the panel. This is very exciting for all of us. Uh, Bonesberry, Brent is here uh, as Kenny the Jet Smith takes a, a sabbatical. Yes, thank you. Yes. I, I, you know what? I don't know sub what sabbatical means. I hope it means fired. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, but, I hope it means fired. But uh, but we digress. Uh, next to Brent is uh, is Reggie Miller. Uh, next to me is Chris Weber, my uh, fan night uh, compatriot. Charles Barkley, uh, looking wide awake, ready to roll. And uh, <laughs> for now, <laughs> next to Charles, uh, Steve Kerr and uh, and Steve Smith, uh, uh, who have just a bundle of championship rings between them. Uh, most of them, Steve Kerr's. Um, topic number one on this show is legacy, and what better place to start than with David Stern, who's been the commissioner of the NBA since 1984, uh, and his his tenure will come to an end in February of of 14. Uh, you're the newcomer, Brent. You get the first crack at it. How do you remember David Stern? Well, I'm also the youngest guy, so I, I don't have as much history as Shaq, had, and, Shaq and, and Charles and, and Reggie have. But uh, I guess for me, it's, it was about being a fan of the game and then actually working for, for David Stern later on in life. And he made the game watchable for me uh, in the 80s growing up and being a teenager and uh, getting a chance to see the game in terms of the product of the game. Uh, take steps towards, you know, being the favorite thing that I wanted to do, and that's watch NBA basketball. So as far as growing the product and making it what I wanted to do later in life as maybe the best first job out of college, you know, David Stern was responsible for the product uh, taking those strides in the 80s when it was that I was looking for something to latch on to. You know, and, and he took the reins here. Things hadn't been exactly smooth, uh, Steve Kerr, in the NBA before uh, the commissioner arrived on the scene. Yeah, tape delayed finals in the late 70s. Um, and then David came around, and, and I love those early shots of him at the draft, by the way, looking very svelte with a mustache. He looked like Schneider from that, uh, <laughs> what was that? Yeah. What was One that? day at a time. One day, One day at a time. time. <laughs> no, when I, when I think of David Stern, I, I think of, when you think of the best coaches in sports, you know, whether it's, you know, Greg Popovich or, you know, Phil Jackson, it's these guys with incredible presence. And there's a there's even a little fear factor from the people who are working for him, and I always looked at Stern in that regard. He always had this amazing presence, and it was necessary. I mean, you had a league, as you mentioned, that was struggling. You had some unbelievable young stars coming into the game with uh, Magic and 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 Larry, and then later on Michael and Charles. But somebody had to put all this together. And somebody had to make some hard decisions, some unpopular decisions, including among them like the salary cap. And they had to figure out, you know, David had to figure out how we're going to implement this between the union and the owners. In the end, I always felt like he was working for the owners. You know, as a player, you're, you're looking at him like, he's, he's not working for us. He's right. working for the owners. But when you sit back and look at it as a player, as a former player, thank God for David Stern because he, he created this whole machine that has allowed all of us uh, to to flourish uh, in our careers, not only playing but but post playing days too. But, but Smitty, I mean, the league had an image problem. I'm not saying that in the year like the year, you know, he came in and, and changed all that. But the league had an image problem leading up to the time that David Stern took well, over. You're right, Ernie. I mean, we talk about the drug infested league in the '80s, and he brought the league out of that. But I think also lack of image for players. I think when you start thinking about David Stern, the NBA product you start thinking globally where he took the game. I was reading something where when he entered the league, it was 23 teams combined, they were worth 400 million. You look now, the average team individually is worth 400 million approximately. So I think financially he took us to a, definitely another, another level. What, um, what is a player commissioner relationship like? When you look at your career, Charles, 
Well, I mean, what, what kind of a relationship did you have with, with Well, let me Stern? say this. As a player, when you get to meet the commissioner, it's not good. <laughs> Unless he's drafted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I've been called to the carpet, I think, three times because I screwed up. But let me pick it back on something these guys said. Me, I feel personal about David Stern. We came into the NBA both together in 1984. And the average salary then was $200,000. The average salary now is $5.5 million. That's unbelievable. That's the average salary. It was $200,000 we came in in 84. Now the average salary is $5.5 million. Just take that alone. That's remarkable. So he took care of the players also. Obviously, you know, these guys talk about how much the teams have appreciated. It's been great for the players also. But for me, taking the game international, you know, his push to get us in the Olympics on the dream team, it's become a worldwide game. Uh, it wasn't a worldwide game. And talk about something else these guys said. It was back in the day, it was like we got a bunch of black guys making a great living smoking pot. That was the NBA's image. He took it from there. You know, we did have an image problem because we all thought like, oh, we got a bunch of black guys making money, but they're all smoking dope. And that's a hard product to market because th this thing is driven by television and, 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 rev uh, and ad sales. And he, he made... I. I would take David Stern and say he is the best commissioner. Now, you look at the NFL, you look at hockey, you look at baseball. It's hard to say there's been a better commissioner to take, to go for the image problems. Now you look where we are financially, but also where we are worldwide. I mean, we play games overseas now, and they draw 20, 30,000 people to see us play in Japan, in China, in Germany, in Italy, France. I mean, it's an international game, and David Stern deserves a lot of credit for that. To me, and you are absolutely right, because that's the, the key. If you look in 1984, how many international players were actually playing in the NBA? Maybe a handful. But now, obviously, this is the league where you want to be, and you want to be focused in, and you want to display your talents. And it's funny, because you, you talk about getting called to the principal's office. Yeah. I was called to the principal's office a few <laughs> times too from David Stern and you get a little bit intimidated when you walk in because you know what is you know what is your dad basically doing calling you to the office <laughs> for some of the screw ups you've done yeah. you know whether you're you know cursing on the court or getting into fights or whatever so it could be a little bit jaw dropping when you get that call from the New York office that David Stern wants to see you. International, like you guys said, him building up the league, but having played with so many international players and going to Serbia or going to other places. I was in Serbia with Popovich, and it was 200,000 people in the middle of the street for Vlade's retirement, and it was all because of the NBA. I don't think we'll be able to really see what David Stern's impact. We can see it now, but I think his impact is going to last in this game a long time. Even players, seven-foot players shooting threes, or all of that is from international players in the world coming together and saying, wait, you can move your skills up. So I just think the whole game has changed because of them. Hey, Shaq, I know you're, you're big into leadership, and you like to, and, and you kind of look at those who have taken leadership roles and see what's made them successful. What leadership um, qualities have you seen in David Stern in the course of almost 30 years? Well, <clears throat> as you can see from all the good that he has done, you can come to the conclusion that he's not a micromanager. You know, even though he's an older fella, if you look at where the game is at now with all the social media, you know, he's, he's smart enough to hire people that's actually probably smarter than him to handle all that for him. You, you know, we all talk about David Stern, but we have to realize he didn't do that by himself. <clears throat> but again, you know, he was smart enough to hire people that were capable and had the ability to, you know, do the things that's going on now. Because, you, you know, back in 84 when he came in, nobody knew about social media, so, you, you know, where the game has gone now and, you know, where David Stern and his team has, has took us, you know, we can say that he's a great leader. And I have to agree with Chuck. You know, he's probably, you know, the greatest uh, uh, commissioner in sports. The good, the good thing, too, is having Adam Silver attached at the hip to him for the last, you know, 10, 15 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think where this league is headed because Adam Silver really learned under David Stern is really going to take the NBA to a different level. So, can I say one thing, Ernie, too, is that, David Stern, for all the years that he's been the commissioner of the league, always talks about the players, the talent of the players, yeah. the ability of our players to impact not only the franchises that they're with, but their ability to impact the communities that they're involved with. And I think that's one of the things that, as much as a taskmaster and, taskmaster and uh, we know how domineering he can be, 
there is a side to David Stern that not a lot of people get to see that I really truly believe deep down that he cares about not only the game of basketball, certainly about the product, but deep down there is a concern for the players and how they're represented and how they represent the franchises. And that part of his legacy, to Webb's point, about going international and impacting communities outside of the United States is something that you're going to see for generations that David Stern's not going to be a part of. But for those of us who've been around this long, we know the genesis is from what it is that he started. You know, Ernie, also, you talk about endorsements. When, 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 I, when we came in 84, players were not doing endorsements. You know, uh, you know, like you think about Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, they had like a little Converse commercial. Then Michael came in and he started doing Nike. But you look now. And you started doing antiperspirants. Yeah, I did. But like <laughs> that, 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 yeah, I did. The light stopped. And, you know, so he, he has to take some credit for that. He started marketing stars. You know, because the NBA is about marketing stars. You know, I give a lot. Of, I've always given credit for Magic and Larry and Michael for taking it to a whole nother level. But, you know, he made it cool to go out and do advertisement. You know, because players, you know, everybody talks about, okay, there's a team, there's a team. But realistically, it's about marketing individual players to, to make the brand grow. Because people want to see stars. They might like their team, but they want to see stars. What was the last line? Anything less? Uh, uncivilized. Would be uncivilized. That's it. Uh, <laughs> uh, pretty good description of this show. Uh, open court. <laughs> Continuing with legacy after this. Listen, I'm not going in the Hall of Fame, but I got a really damn big house to sit in while people calling me names. Like, it ain't no <laughs> right. Seriously. No, that, that's a, it's an interesting... It's a, it's a, uh, that's you know. my point. Back here on Open Court, uh, and we're talking legacy, and I, and I guess this is kind of a, one of the downsides of sport when you talk about the legacy of performance-enhancing drugs. Um, and you can talk about specific players who have been caught up in that net, or you can just talk about how pervasive it's been in various sports. Um, are, are we ever going to, after we've gotten to this point, are we ever not going to be talking about that? Are we ever going to get to a point where Everybody's just playing the game on the up and up, play it clean, rehab your injuries the right way, or are you always looking for the next deer antler spray, Steve? I think we're always going to be talking about this stuff because it, it seems like it's impossible to differentiate between one thing and another. Every athlete's going to push the limit as far as they can in terms of what they can do to get better, and then it's up to the individual athlete to decide if he's going to cross that line. But I think there's a gray area that some, you know, sometimes guys kind of get into where they're not even sure if they're, if they're taking something that's, uh, that's illegal or not. Science is ever-changing, and I think we are always going to talk about players taking per performance-enhancing drugs because what's interesting is uh, I've asked myself this question. If we could take a pill or deer antler spray <laughs> that could make us perform to the level of Michael Jordan to compete at that level because he was so far advanced over everyone. If you could take a pill and compete with Michael Jordan at that level, would we have taken that in the 90s? Well, the moral I, question, though. If it's no, I'm just saying if it wouldn't, if it, if it wouldn't hurt you, if, if, it, if it wasn't going to hurt you but make you perform but if you, at that level. But if you I, knew I, it was against the exactly, rule of your the sport. Moral, oh, right, hold on. But here, here's my thing. I, I, don't, I don't know. Hold, hold let me make this one point. I don't know. See, I, I, I don't think it has anything to do with morality, Ernie. I think it has something to do with economics. And I've said this before. If I'm poor... And I'm not quite good enough. And I, let's say I don't want to single out any country or something. But if I'm poor and I'm coming from some little island and I got a chance to make 10, 20, 30 million dollars a year, I ain't going to lie. I'm shooting some in my ass. Well, that's what most base, you know, it's, when you're talking to the, about the baseball I, players. I am. Yeah. I, I mean, am. Because I, that's I, and essentially, I, I, I try not <laughs> to ever be a hypocrite. I, I don't ever want to be a hypocrite. It's so easy for these guys who got great lives say, I wouldn't do this. But if I'm from some little island and the whole island is poor and I got a chance to make $20 million a year, like, I, like I'm not worried about the moral high ground. I'm trying to make life better for my family. I know. Well, I see, I see that 
part of it, but the, the other part of it is that you do have guys who are well off and who have established careers and are stars in their various leagues mm -hmm. who still see a need to cross that line. They do that because the pressure of winning gets so high. You know, we're all in the, in the business of, you know, being analysts now. We, we put a lot of pressure on them. The critics put a lot of pressure on them. They put a lot of pressure on themselves. So the pressure of winning is so high that, you know, sometimes you do things you're, you're not supposed to do. I don't lie. Every now and then, I used to look at the, the, the thing that the NBA, which was letter of the law. So, and I'd go in GNC and I'd see some fat boy burner plus and I'd check it. So if I didn't see something that was on the letter of the law, I would think it's okay. But see, a lot of time where these guys get in trouble is the derivatives of something that's on the letter of the law. See, we don't know that. See, like, you know, we'll, we'll just go in GNC, fat boy, burn it plus, lose 20 pounds in 10 days. We'll check it, boom, 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 it's nothing uh, there. Is that what we'll it's really it. called? No, but, you know, <laughs> I, always, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I always used to go in. Ernie, I, I think we did, though. I think when I was young, you know, people say go get a weight vest. I ran out and got a weight vest. Them little moon boots to jump yeah. higher. Mm -hmm. Creatine. Mm, I had yeah. no clue what was in creatine. I started taking it because they said I need to be stronger. I mean, creatine could have been mm -hmm. something that was banned. <clears throat> so I think we did do it in our generation. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't a lot of stuff out there. And I think also, you look at different sports. In basketball, you probably don't see it. Our contracts are guaranteed. Probably if I was playing football and my contract wasn't guaranteed to feed my family, you never know what you would do because you don't have guaranteed contracts like we have in professional baseball and professional basketball. It is interesting that, and I don't know if you guys ever experienced any of it, but I can honestly say in 15 years of playing in the NBA, I never suspected a single teammate of taking a PED. Maybe I'm a little naive, but I really believe that it was just not part of the, the basketball culture. But I don't know why that's, that's the case, because there's got to be stuff that we could have taken to, to re help recovery, you know, all the stuff the Tour de France mm -hmm. guys were doing, maybe that would help NBA players. But do you guys ever remember? I never saw a guy uh, use PEDs in any shape, form whatsoever. But like I say, I try not to ever be a hypocrite on television or whatever. If, if I wasn't quite good enough, because like, obviously there's so many players who are really close to being good enough to play at the NBA. If I could take a shot or take a, some pills, I probably would do it because this is all, like basketball was going to be my job, my career. And there's a lot of guys who ain't quite good enough to play in the NBA. Like, and it's such a fine line. You guys know that. And if but I here's and I, the question, do you take that pill to make it into the NBA? Or are you taking that pill once you're in it to take you to another level to compete with the Shaquille O'Neal's with the LeBron James with the Kobe Bryant's see that's the gray area that people are talking about. You've got guys that are already in professional baseball, in football, that have made it, that are stars, and then they take it, they blow up yeah. to make all these enormous records. Th but to me, that's what I have a problem with. But that, They've already made it, and now they're trying to solidify themselves and take it to a different because level. Because there's so much pressure on stars to put up numbers, like Shaquille said. I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, to be honest with you, because you know you're going to get killed if you don't play well. So you're like, I want to stay at this level because because the players aren't judged by they judge by how much money they make. Right. You know, so they're like, oh, this guy's making twenty five million dollars. He's got to do this. He's not playing well. So there's enormous pressure on you. To be honest with you, I was battling a shoulder injury throughout my workouts. I took something that I shouldn't be taking. I should have double search, research what I would should have take. And shouldn't be in this situation right now, but I'm really sorry, you know, to put myself in this situation and the organization too. One of your one of your former teammates suspended this year in the NBA, Hito Turgaloo. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think you got to watch your trainer, you know, too, because these guys said you trust. So when I played, there were several trainers. I'm sure all you guys worked out. I worked out with, and I trust blindly. You know, give me eggs, give me your food, and things like that. So I, I've never though seen or suspected anybody. In the history, and if you look at Hito Body, he's taking the wrong PED. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you look at his numbers, and PED yeah. may not be the right thing to say. Yeah, but it wasn't you know, exactly enhancing anything. I played with Lindsey Hunter in Detroit, and it was funny. He got suspended 10 games for taking his wife's diet pill. 
and we were teasing him because <laughs> he was just out of shape. And you that know, was probably worse than the suspension. Just hearing what you guys. Yeah, had to yeah say about you know, that. you know. But one thing though is that in basketball, I think we're a little bit lucky and different. Like you said, you know, you can't just sit here and judge. But in basketball, you know, your skill set kind of makes you. You could be a fat, slow guy and still be able to post up. You could run. You know, I don't. I don't think we've we've ever had to really see that, and I hope in basketball you never do see that because of the skill set. Now, in other sports, you know, I, I don't know why, but when you have guys, I will say when you have guys that are already there and have won something six, seven times, eight times, and you take, you know, the community's trust and things like that, I think morally you might have a responsibility once you're already there. But like you said, if I'm coming from another country or if I have nothing or, you know, who, who knows what it is. I'm just glad we were never put in that position. After denying it for years, Lance Armstrong admitted to Oprah that he used performance enhancing drugs during his cycling career. Did the Lance Armstrong thing tick you off? Or how did, how did you view that when, you, when all this came out? Well, first of all, I wasn't shocked. You know, if everybody else in the race has, has everybody else, every Tour de France winner has gotten busted for drugs, to think that the one guy who had cancer beat those guys who were doing drugs, didn't take drugs, I think you have to be a total idiot to be like, oh, knock me over with a feather. So I, I, was, I wasn't surprised at all, to be honest with you. Uh, not surprised, but I think what separates Lance is how he handled things and the people around him who was calling him out, he made their life a living hell when all they were doing was telling the truth. And because he had so much power in that sport of yeah. winning all those championships yeah. and lying, yeah. he, he threw everyone underneath the bus. And the way he treated people around him, the people that were calling him out, that's the problem I have with Lance Armstrong. And, and I wanted to, I'm going to agree with Reggie. And, I, and I've said this before. Listen, the drug thing is different. The way Lance treated people behind the scenes, he owed those people an apology. The last ballot for the Baseball Hall of Fame, you had Barry Bonds, you had Roger Clemens, Rafael Palmeiro, all these guys that were allegedly using PEDs. Should they be in the... Should they be in the... Yes. The, sh okay, so there should be a different wing then. No. If you're, if you're Hank Aaron, but if you're Hank Aaron, okay, you're I'm sitting... Not, I'm going to tell you why If you're think, Hank Aaron, you're sitting back saying, you've got to be kidding me. Let, let, let me tell you why. You've got to be this, kidding and me. I've, no, I'm going to tell you why. Everybody benefited from McGuire and Sosa. I agree. They saved baseball. Roger Clemens, Barry Bonds. The, the problem I have with that is baseball benefited. The whole thing. All, all the teams and franchises They turned exploded. a blind eye. I yes. agree with you. But, but that starts with the commissioner, yes. too. But my problem I have with the whole thing is, Reggie, the only guy, they're only penalizing the five Hall of Famers. Let me ask this, Charles. Is the, the weight and the pressure of having to handle now the responsibility of you being caught cheating during your athletic career, does that outweigh the glory that they had when they were playing the game? That goes, that goes back to what I said earlier. Like, listen, I'm not going in the Hall of Fame, but I got a really damn big house to sit in while people calling me names. Like, it ain't no <laughs> right. Seriously. No, that, that's a, it's an interesting... It's a, it's a, uh, that's you know, my point. That's why I say it's an it's a, it's a interesting dilemma. Like, you know, we talk about track and field. If I'm in one of those little island countries, and the only way I can really make a good living is running a 100-yard dash in eight seconds, <laughs> I'm doing it. You know, because we all been to those islands. We go to the resort part of the island. We don't see how the other island is. So, I, I agree with you. I would, I would probably do the same thing. Yeah. But are we drawing two different moral lines, one for the poor people and one for the rich people? Like, are we saying it's okay for no, 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 the poor but, people no, from no, an no, island to I, do it, but, but the, the rich guy who's trying to take the next step, like, no, we're, gonna, we're not going to allow that? It, it, well, I, no, I, I, I don't think there's a double shot, but I'm saying we have to – we're not in other people's shoes. And if you got a chance to take a pill and you're going to make millions and millions of dollars a year – you going to take that chance. How about you put them in the Hall of Fame, but there's no ceremony? See, I disagree with that. Everybody benefited. The players all around benefited. In the short term? In the, uh, in the long term. In the term. short term. Uh, no, it, Baseball did not benefit from this whole, this whole steroid. Baseball well, financially, the fi players benefited. The, the players benefited mm -hmm. and the teams benefited. But baseball took a hit from baseball fans all over the place. From Come the on fan, now. Attendance not down. Attendance not down. No, I'm, t I'm talking about in the midst of all that. No, it no, certainly but, did. Well, but attendance you don't not... Think, you don't think that gave baseball a black eye? It gave baseball a black eye, but uh, ratings and attendance have still been going through the roof. I, they I, have rebounded to they, an extent. Yeah. But I, I'm still saying, 
But, if, if baseball, if you're the commissioner of baseball and you say, let's see, would I have liked to have a, a, a steroid scandal? No, uh, sure, I, I don't I'd love think to they have want that. to. That'd be great for the game. But Ernie, do you don't think Blake got, um, baseball turned a blind eye sure. to what was going on? Sure. I th- what Charles is saying is that the numbers went up in terms of like stats, RBI, so, so a lot of, and then all of a sudden, salaries. everybody's salaries go with it. And so pi- you're saying financially, yes. other players benefit. And like right? I said, yeah, they, it was a scandal, but revenue has continued to climb. But to penalize those four guys, when everybody, first of all, everybody knew it was going on. Everybody knew it was going on. Listen, that's like, listen, when guys' heads are bigger than mine, when, when you're five two and your head bigger than mine, it ain't like you got you still don't know something going on. Well, I'm just saying, yeah. I'm saying, you give them their due, they're in the Hall of Fame. We're just not going to celebrate it. You're just not going to be at the but, podium telling the, me how you but, did it. But the four guys or the five guys you mentioned, if you want them to go in the Hall of Fame, has any one of them come out and said, I actually took it? So now you're going to take away their public spectacle of getting to the podium and thanking everyone when they've said, look, I've never taken any PEDs, so why are you taking away my time to shine if I'm in the Hall of Fame? Do you doubt that they did? What's that? Do you doubt that they did? No, I'm assuming. Neither does anybody else. I'm assuming they did, but I, I will say this. Look, my neighbor in Malibu, Ryan Braun, one of the biggest stars in baseball, allegedly, yeah. is under fire for the same thing. He has sworn up and down to me and to, you know, America that he's never done anything. But there will always be that public perception because of what he went through. We don't know. They've all said they haven't done anything. We can assume, we can look at Barry Bonds and say, look, he won three MVPs in Pittsburgh, and he was my size. When he got to San Francisco, he ended up like Charles. So apparently this? something was going on. How about this? If you admit it, we'll let you in. If you come out and come clean and help, oh, help the whole process, we'll let you in. Oh, let me make one point, though. Ernie, it wasn't, they weren't testing for those drugs either. That's the one thing people don't talk about. They were not tested for those drugs. They weren't technically illegal. Were they immoral? If you want to go that way. I think early they were no, legal, but, yeah, but by the but time, by the time were still at playing, the end, it was, yeah. it was they definitely were on the list. illegal. Yeah, at yeah. the end. But they were not testing for it in their yeah, like heyday. Like the Andro stuff. That, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. that was legal. That was time. legal. Right, right. So, so they started, when guys started hitting 70 home runs, they wanted to start testing for it. But during that entire period, the McGuire Sosa era, they were not even testing for those drugs. Most of the people I know use PEDs in their 60s anyway. You know, <laughs> Viagra get it popping. <laughs> Viagra get it popping. <laughs> so I got something to look forward to. <laughs> Those are the PEDs that, the, that you should be using, right? A lot right? of kids, there's a lot of young kids with a, with a 75-year-old dad. And them performance <laughs> whether, and whether that gets you in the Hall of Fame, I don't really know. Um, back with more on open court. <laughs> I remember how much players embraced the fact that President Obama had won the election. They all were writing things on their shoes. They were wearing special edition this and special edition that. But what really was happening was there was a seed planted for a whole other generation and mostly young African-American black kids about being politically active. A few young people here, they would like to be president of the United States. If you'd like to, don't give it up. You don't have to give it up. Because in spite of everything, I want you to remember one thing. You can do anything that you want to do, if you want to do it bad enough. Thank you very much. Bill Russell, the man, is someone who stood up for the rights and dignity of all men. He marched with King. He stood by Ali. When a restaurant refused to serve the black Celtics, he refused to play in the scheduled game. But he kept on focusing on making the teammates who he loved better players and made possible the success of so many who would follow. Obviously a powerful piece of, uh, of video of Bill Russell from, from years and years ago and, and saying you can be anything you want and then later to be awarded the medal by President Obama, what when you talk about legacy, there, um, Smitty, what did it what did it mean first time you saw Barack Obama uh, inaugurated? You know that moment me for me was special. My dad, who's 83, cried, said in his lifetime he never thought he'd see an African American be president. So, just to see his emotion from what happened, 
obviously I was moved as well, but I would never forget the emotion of my dad saying, this is something in my lifetime that I would never ever thought would happen. But getting a chance to meet Obama, being around him, spend some time with him, um, actually play basketball with him. You know, he's one of those presidents that's approachable. He's one of us, not like that other presidents are not. Uh, one of the most socially conscious presidents we have, one of the most relatable presidents we've had. And I think he gets it. Do you think, and this is a, it's a strange question, Charles, but do you think when Bill Russell said that in that piece of video, that he actually ever thought he would see it? No. You know, the, the night the president got elected, I cried. Because being from Alabama, you know, I grew up during the time where they bombed the church, church, the Selma March, the Montgomery boycott, things like that. So my grandmother, who's the greatest person I've ever met in my life, talked to me constantly growing up about civil rights. Tell me, talking about, like, understand you're too young now, but then when I got older, she explained everything to me. Bill Russell to me. You know, people talk about raising taxes all the time, about President Obama. And Bill Russell said something to me one time, because he's one of the great men, a great man. He was talking about higher taxes and things in the 60s. And he he's telling me the story. He said, this guy came up to him after. He says, Mr. Russell, I got to disagree with you about taxes. He said, yes, sir. You tell me why you disagree. He says, when I'm successful, why should I pay more in taxes? And this is what Mr. Russell was talking about in the 60s. He says, Hey, you go to school, don't you? You went to school, didn't you? He, the guy said, yeah. He says, somebody paid taxes for you to go to school. He said, when somebody commit a crime, don't the cops come to your house? He said, yeah, somebody paid taxes so the cops can come to your house. And it was so profound to me, now that I'm successful, because when you become successful, you kind of go in your own little world. I said, you know what? I am successful. I should pay more in taxes. And when, when we talk about this and, and trying to keep it away from politics and I think this, you think this, but I think when you when you see uh, the inauguration now for a second term, um, and you hear Bill Russell say that, did you grow up thinking that you would see an African American president? I think when we talk about uh, President Obama and going forward, the word obviously, and he ran this in his first election, hope comes to mind, because we never thought we'd see an African American a, a president, and there are young. African American boys and girls that are looking at this and, and watching him each and every day giving press conferences from the Oval Office and from the White House briefing room saying, I can do that. Because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. And during his first election, when he came out for his acceptance speech in Chicago, and there was two, 300,000 people there, and they just kept showing the audience. And there was black people, white people, all together, mixed, crying together. And you talk about the marching and the Alabamas and the bombings. We've come so far, and his legacy going forward, I think he's brought this nation closer together in race relations. And I think that's what people will hang their hat on when it comes to Obama going forward. When I watch what he has to go through, and he keeps his cool, he's inspired me. Well, you know, being a monkey on the newspaper, and you know, they painted him as a monkey, them talking about his wife, and he always keeps his cool. We're the only one talking about Obama being black. You never hear him say any of that, and I know he's getting stabbed by his people, people around, and so <laughs> what I take is that he hasn't made any excuses once he's been up there, and he's one of the most coolest cats because he won't call out the obvious of everybody not accepting him, and I think not only inspiring, but he also says, listen, once I'm here, I don't have an excuse. The, the great thing for me about President Obama, he lets these young black kids know they can be academically successful. Because I love sports, because sports have given me everything in my life. But I'm not sure it's great for black kids. Because I, I, when you go speak to black kids, all they say, they want to be Chris Webber, Reggie Miller, Shaquille O'Neal, Steve Smith, or they want to be Jay-Z, Kanye West. Like, you got a better chance of being a doctor, lawyer, engineer, teacher, fireman, policeman, things like that. That, to me, is pre President Obama's greatest legacy. But, you know, he, he's an Ivy League-educated guy, and they're not going to be Chris Webber or Charles Barkley or Steve Smith. 
but they can be academically successful. That's what I think his greatest legacy is. One of the biggest impacts, I think, Chuck, is that I was still playing at the time when President Obama was uh, first elected. And I, I remember how much players embraced the fact that President Obama had won the election. They all were writing things on their shoes. They were wearing special edition this and special edition that. But what really was happening was there was a seed planted for a whole other generation and mostly young African-American black kids about being politically active, about being involved in politics, about having a chance to have your voice be heard. So, you know, whatever it was, six, seven years ago now, you know, Dwayne Wade, LeBron James, now their kids are going to see that the impact that President Obama made on, made on them during this time, while they're impressionable young men, is going to carry on for generations of their family, that now politics is something that actually they can be involved in and that it's okay to be involved in and it's okay to use your voice. And I think includers. that's where the legacy comes in. I agree, but NL and I'm just going to be honest, I never really celebrated the 4th of July until Obama was president. It was just, uh, it was just a vacation because, you know, sometimes you don't feel like you're part of it. You know, if your mother's a community organizer and you're doing this, or if you're in the poor rural part of America and you don't see that you can become one of them. And I, that was one of the funniest things to me going around talking to people about the 4th of July. Like, it's not just a barbecue anymore. They're actually waving flags like, <laughs> I'm a part of this country. You know, I've always known that and felt that, but I, I'd always haven't seen that or, or or, or felt like it had come together. Someone had said, you know, he brought the whole country together. And I think, you know, it added patriotism for a lot of people. A lot of people love the country. They don't want to go anywhere else. This is my country. But I think it, it, it made people not only want to get involved in politics, but it made people feel like, yeah, wait, wait a minute. You know, this country does care about everyone. And I think that, you know, the patriotism that he's brought about people saying, you know, I've always been proud to be here. I always loved it. But wait a minute. It does mean a little something more. It, Reggie mentioned the um, race relations going forward and, and the legacy in that regard. I think one of the most important things that Obama has done in his tenure is embracing same-sex marriage, you mm -hmm. know, because there's discrimination of all sorts, right? right? Yes. And so <clears throat> for the longest time in our country, there's been discrimination of gay and lesbian people. And now all of a sudden you you have a black president for the first time ever mm -hmm. trying to push forward more equality for everybody there's a lot of issues besides you know just pure racism mm -hmm. there's there's inequality there's injustice and I think just the fact that he's in that office that he carries himself the way he is right. and the way he does and that he's tried to push forward some of these other social agendas to bring people together I think that's that's huge Shaq I'll give you the last word <clears throat> you know when you, you know if you go back to as far as the Martin Luther King speech you know we're, we're all dreamers We've never thought this this day would be here, but you, you know we all make great points. But I'm gonna go go off, off of what Chris Weber said. You know the guy is is under a lot of criticism all the time, and he never cracks under pressure. You know I just love that he's so eloquent, he's so smooth, uh, and you know I just love the way he handles pressure. And you know he's doing a he's doing a good job. And you know, behind a er, and tough behind job, sorry, tough job. You know he can't please everybody all the time, but you, you know he wasn't. He wasn't handed a silver platter. You know, he was handed a mess, and, you know, I think he's doing beautiful. And, you know, he's a beautiful family. He's a family man, and he's a great president. And I'm just glad that I'm still around, you know, to see this day, and behind, as well as my children. And behind every great man, there's a great woman. we got to give Michelle Obama a lot of credit, too, seriously, because what she does in the White House, especially raising two daughters, under the scrutiny and the hot lights of being in the, in the White House, yeah. It's, it's pretty remarkable how, as well. And how amazing is it? You see the clip of Russell. That was 1968, right? Mm -hmm. right? And he said in 40 years we could have an African-American president. It was exactly 40 years, yeah. right? 2008 when it happened. I mean, that, when I first saw that Russell clip, it kind of, you know, took me a second to do the math because yeah, yeah. I'm, you know... But isn't that incredible yeah, just right. to But to I'm glad you mentioned that? mentioned Michelle because uh, like you said, she's the backbone of Obama and yep. you know they're a royal family and I'm glad to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Legacy on Open Court. We'll be back. Welcome back to Open Court. When you talk about legacy, uh, where is LeBron right now? 
because for a while we're seeing him do things nobody's ever done. So on a scale of 1 to 10, where is LeBron James right now, Steve Smith? You know, I don't think we've seen the best of LeBron James because of the competition he's playing against. I, I think in this era, nothing wrong with this era, I, I don't think he's getting challenged enough. So what? give me a number. Well, I, I would say around a 9. The You're, one area I, I would love to see, which is scary for the league, if he starts shooting about 85% from the line. Nine. I'll give him a nine. Nine. I think nine's fair. Nine. Room for improvement, eight plus. <clears throat> Over the last month, I'll spinal tap it and say 11. 11. Oh, wait till <laughs> 11. Oh, yeah. Shaq. I'm going to give him a seven, and this is the reason why. Unfortunately, he's going to be always compared to Kobe and Mike. Mike has six, Kobe has five. So I think, you know, we, the critics, you know, when they keep saying you don't have as many rings, I think that's going to uh, a few him even more. So I think he's at a seven, and I think, you know, there's more space for him to even dominate more. LeBron, I believe, has done the most on the court with the most expectations out of any player that's ever played in the NBA. Jordan didn't have this expectation on him having $100 million before he stepped on the court. Before he stepped on the court, you're hearing about this kid in high school. You know, even taking, you know, I, I, Jordan had good teams and, and Kobe as well, but even taking that Cleveland team to the finals. Kobe Bryant struggled coming out of high school. Kevin Garnett struggled coming out of high school. LeBron James, he played well the first game. This kid from day one came to the NBA and has exceeded everybody's expectation. You know, Le LeBron's rookie year, um, because I had a chance to play against him. And I was like, you know, the hype was coming in, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to throw some of these old tricks on him. You know, we were running the sing single double action, you know, where you can come off. And you know how I used to throw you guys off when you guys were holding, yeah, you know, throw and one go one way. <laughs> Smitty, I'm like, I'm going well. to use this on this young cat. You know, he, he doesn't know the game yet. I go to throw him, he's right there. I try to throw him to the left, he's right there. I'm like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble down here. I mean, he was so much stronger at that age. Yeah. I'm like, we're in trouble tonight with this young kid. So it lets you know that physically, I don't think we'll never see physically gifted another player like that for a long time. Ernie, there's only been three guys. Michael, who I said, they're physically gifted than everybody at their position. They're more physically gifted. Michael, LeBron, and Shaquille. The first time I met Shaquille. Oscar. I'm throwing Oscar, too. And Wilt. Uh, and Wilt. I mean, just for. It, yeah, well, I mean, I mean, guys, I, <laughs> it, doing my time. Yeah. I was like, they're going to be better than everybody they play against every night. Uh, and, and, like, and there's tons of great players. But there's only three guys I've seen. I says, oh, it, like some nights when you're a great player, you have an advantage 99% of the time. And the rest of the time, like, okay, i got to bring it tonight. This guy's just as good as I am. But every time Michael, LeBron, and Shaquille stepped on the court, there's nobody. They're always better than some. And that's the only three times I've said that. You're watching Open Court. We're talking about legacy. And, and when we come back, it's the ever-popular lightning round. Short answers. Back in a minute. I told my father Magic was coming to the house. And uh, he woke up, cut the grass and everything. And he had worked for Cadillac. 30 years and never could buy a Cadillac, and so I got him a, a Cadillac. And he still wants to know where magic was. <laughs> <laughs> and we welcome you back to Open Court with a reminder you can catch more episodes on NBA.com. All right, welcome back to, uh, to Open Court. Time for the lightning round. Uh, it's just one question, and, uh, and you just fire away. First thing you bought with your first NBA check, Smitty? A car. What kind? I'm trying to think. Give me a car. What Cherokee kind of car? Limited. I was playing uh, MC Breed, Ain't No Future in Your Front. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Kerr. A uh, set of golf clubs. Yeah. What? set of golf clubs. I was in Phoenix. My rookie year, went out to the Ping factory, got sized up, and Great. started playing golf. Yeah, okay, Chuckster. I bought my mom and my grandmother a car. What'd you, what'd you get? Them? Some type of Oldsmobile. Uh, two old, Oldsmobile. S same kind? Uh, two <laughs> same kind. <laughs> no, different models, but they were Oldsmobile. Okay, <laughs> see? I told my father Magic was coming to the house, and uh, he woke up, cut the grass and everything, and he had worked for Cadillac. 
30 years and never could buy a Cadillac. And so I got him a, a Cadillac. He still wants to know where magic was. <laughs> <laughs> Love that, Rich. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, a new wardrobe. When I got to Indiana, and really it was a, a winter coat. Herb Williams, John Long. I said, you from California, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, it's cold around here. <laughs> they, they took me to get a new winter coat. Uh, I didn't have a car, Ernie, so I bought the album, Ain't No Future in Your Front. And <laughs> <laughs> I just put that in my buddy's car. <laughs> what you, what's the first Honestly, the first check, I, I still have it. Do you really? Did not cash it. Just held on to it and think about the work that I put in and the things that I did to get there. So I still have it. Where you, is it? You know, you could have cashed it. Just, it just, just kept it. Yeah. Yeah. You could have cashed it and kept it. For the symbolism. Of it. <laughs> I, I do have it. <laughs> kept it. 90 Check. days, can't cash it anymore. I bought a black on black Benz with some hammers on that thing and the uh, Alpine pull out CD deck. And when I got home, my father was like, that's nice. Where's mine at? So then we got in the car and I had to go buy him one too. <laughs> wow, wow. Small, that's a small good, world. That's number the first one thing I did with my first Turner <laughs> chest. That's number one. Big <laughs> money right there. <laughs> Ernie, Ernie, Ernie. Ernie. What did you buy with saying. your first Turner? Ernie? With my, with my first Turner yes. chest? Yes. yes. Same story as Shaq. Uh, <laughs> that's it for, uh, for Open Court. Uh, thank you for watching us. We'll see you next time here on NBA TV.